Hi everybody. In the last few lectures we discussed how the Schrodinger's equation can be used to solve the hydrogen atom problem uh, as well as uh, uh, more ambitious problems such as uh, those involving larger atoms, uh, systems involving more than one atom such as molecular ions and uh, molecules and uh, gradually we moved on to uh, solid state uh, situations meaning systems involving a very large number of uh, atoms. Towards the very end of the previous lecture, we got a glimpse of uh, this thing called the band structure, uh, in which uh, the energy uh, of the electrons, the energy that electrons can possibly take, uh, is plotted as a function of this mysterious quantity uh, K. And we also noted that uh, this K can be looked upon as a bookkeeping device. Uh, it, it, is, it essentially labels the various wave functions that are associated with the uh, energy levels. So that's where we ended. You know, we ended with the energy versus K diagram. Um, and now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to get deeper into that concept, the concept of the band structure. So what we will essentially do is to touch upon this uh, very important theorem called the Bloch's theorem. And uh, the Bloch's theorem provides us with a, with a way of figuring out the nature of our wave functions, nature of the wave functions of our electrons, uh, which are encountering a periodic potential. So we are going to view our solid as composed of a periodic arrangement of atoms, in other words, a periodic arrangement of nuclei and each nuclei brings with it a Coulomb potential and so when you add up all of these Coulomb potentials due to this regular arrangement of nuclei you get a periodic potential which is the potential that our electron sees and Bloch's theorem provides us with a way of uh, using the prior knowledge about the periodic potential to uh, figure out the nature or the form of the wave function. Okay, so let's write down the specific equation we are trying to solve, which is the time independent Schrodinger's equation for our electron moving in a periodic uh, potential. The term in the square brackets uh, is, of course, our Hamiltonian, uh, with the first term representing the kinetic energy operator, and uh, the second term represents the, uh, the potential that our electron uh, uh, is seeing. Now, since the potential is uh, really the sum of the Coulomb potentials due to the individual nuclei, we can write uh, uh, the capital V uh, as a function of R in the following manner. So, the small v uh, represents the uh, Coulomb potential due to each of our nuclei. Um, and since it's the Coulomb potential, small v is going to be minus z e squared over R minus capital Ri. And capital Ri... Uh, represents the uh, positions of our uh, nuclei. Right? So we have an array of nuclei at positions Ri and the Coulomb potential due to each such nucle nucleus is minus Z e squared over R minus Ri and you add up all of that we get the periodic potential that our uh, electron is going to experience. We could uh, actually visually also uh, show this periodic potential in this manner so there it is. Uh, if you just had one, one nucleus sitting over there, uh, its Coulomb potential is going to be of this form, minus z uh, e squared over r, where z is of course the atomic number of our nucleus. And uh, so the Coulomb potential due to that particular nucleus is going to have this form. Right? It's going to blow up of course at the position of the nucleus. It goes to minus infinity. Um, and, and this is the general form. Now, if you have a collection of such nuclei uh, uh, arranged in a periodic manner, so you have the first nucleus here, second one here, etc. and so forth, each one is going to lead to a Coulomb potential of this type. And the sum total of the uh, Coulomb potentials due to each of the many nuclei is going to look uh, like this, look uh, uh, like this. Right? So our potential is periodic. It uh, reflects the underlying symmetry of our uh, lattice itself. And so our electron is actually seeing this periodic potential. 
So the Schrodinger's equation that we wish to solve, as I mentioned earlier, is exactly this uh, with, the, with our potential suitably defined. You see, in the past we encountered uh, several situations, the hydrogen atom, the harmonic oscillator, a uh, particle in a box, etc., where we had to suitably define our uh, potential and solve the corresponding Schrodinger's equation. So for a solid, for, a, for an electron in a solid, uh, this is the equation we need to solve with our uh, potential defined in this, uh, in this manner. Now, for a moment, let us consider the situation when our uh, potential is turned off or the potential is a constant. For simplicity, let's just assume that the potential has been turned off and set to zero. Right. Uh, this is a case we have already seen before. Um, when our v of r tends to zero, our solution for the wave function is, of course, a plane wave. It's e to the i k r, and uh, we have encountered this in the past. And this is a free electron solution, and our energy e is going to be equal to h bar squared k squared over two m. Okay, so this is what happens, right? So we've already seen this before. E equals h bar squared k squared over 2m. So in case uh, you're wondering what is a reciprocal space quantity such as k doing in this equation for uh, the energy, uh, here is a way to look at it. Uh, we are familiar with uh, uh, the momentum p. And uh, if we want the energy, the kinetic energy of a system with momentum p, we would write it as p squared over 2m. Now, because of uh, the de Broglie uh, relationship between the momentum uh, of a particle and the wavelength of the uh, uh, wave corresponding to that particle, uh, we have this relationship p equals h bar k. And for that reason, we get the result that uh, for our free electron, um, its energy uh, essentially, it's kinetic energy uh, as being h bar squared k squared over 2m. We have made these observations in the past uh, when we discussed uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, so it's really no coincidence um, that uh, we get this expression for the uh, energy of our free electron. So here is the relationship between E and k, you see. So now E the energy is related uh, quadratically uh, to k. Now, for a brief moment, let us uh, compare and contrast uh, this situation with something similar we had encountered earlier within the context of uh, phonons and uh, lattice waves. There, too, we have a, a relationship between the frequency, omega, and uh, a reciprocal space quantity, q. Of course, note that... Uh, uh, k and Q are equivalent. They are both reciprocal space quantities. They both represent uh, 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 wave numbers or uh, wave vectors. Uh, and so it would be uh, very useful, rather useful, to compare um, the behavior of electrons versus uh, phonons. So here is such a comparison. You see, uh, in the case of electrons, the energy is quadratically related to K. Uh, Whereas in the case of phonons, the frequency omega is linearly related to the uh, uh, wave number or wave vector q. Bear in mind though that although in the case of phonons or lattice waves, the y-axis is generally uh, uh, used for uh, plotting omega, uh, omega is really the same as E because you can multiply omega by h bar and you will get the energy corresponding to your, uh, to your lattice wave. And Q is, of course, the same as K. Let us now make another very important observation. Uh, let us remember that in the case of phonons, we noted that uh, Bragg scattering occurs at special values of uh, K or Q. Let us assume that we are considering a 1D lattice with lattice parameter A. Then at uh, K equals plus minus pi over A, um, Bragg scattering occurs and the phonon dispersion relationship is going to deviate from linearity uh, leading to a cutoff frequency in the case of a monatomic lattice and uh, in the case of a diatomic uh, uh, lattice we get uh, gaps and so forth. Let us uh, remind ourselves uh, how this uh, deviation from linearity takes shape using a couple of pictures. 
So here they are, the correct results that take into account the deviations from linearity of the dispersion relationship uh, are shown in uh, using black lines for, for both the monatomic uh, and the diatomic uh, cases. In the case of the monatomic uh, lattice, the deviations occur at very close to plus minus pi over a, the Brevoix zone edge, um, due to Bragg scattering, and you encounter an upper cutoff meaning no modes can exist with frequencies higher than a, uh, on a, than a certain cutoff. In the diatomic case, you have additional features. We encountered what are called as acoustic uh, uh, branches and optical branches and so forth. So uh, this is a good time to actually go back and look at those lectures on phonons uh, if necessary. Something very similar to this happens with our electrons as well. Right, so that's that's kind of what we are going to uh, handle next. So in the case of electrons, um, if we turn off our periodic potential, uh, we get a quadratic uh, result, a quadratic dependence of the energy uh, with respect to uh, the wave vector or wave number k. Now if we turn back our potential on, we are going to encounter our electrons are going to encounter Bragg scattering at the Brevon zone boundaries and as a, as a result we're going to see deviations from this quadratic behavior just like in the case of phonons we saw deviations from the linear behavior let's show this pictorially okay so here is what happens this is very interesting so I'm going to move this up a little bit to give myself a little more room um, okay so the blue line that you see is our original parabola that's the E equals h bar squared k squared over 2m behavior. That happens when we turn off the periodic potential. Now let's turn this knob and uh, turn back our periodic potential on gradually. When we do that, uh, these, uh, these deviations begin to happen. And they happen at special values of uh, uh, the wave number k. Okay? Uh, plus minus uh, pi over a. Uh, plus minus 2 pi over a and so forth. So this region uh, minus pi over a to plus pi over a is called the first Brevon zone and uh, this region here along with this region um, is called the second Brevon zone uh, and so forth. Let us now take recourse to this concept called zone folding which we have encountered in the past when we talked about phonons and uh, it works uh, in a very simple manner uh, like this. So let us first uh, make the observation that this region over here um, is uh, the length of this region is uh, 2 pi over a which is uh, which is our basic unit of a reciprocal lattice vector right. So our reciprocal lattice vectors are integer multiples of 2 pi over a given that uh, we have a 1D lattice of lattice constant a. So which means that we can translate uh, these branches you know for example we can take this branch and move it uh, to the left by um, uh, 2 pi over a uh, so when you do that this branch here becomes uh, a branch like that and likewise when we translate this branch by 2 pi over a to the right it will go down here and and likewise uh, these branches so when we do that translation what we will be left with is uh, is this piece over here and this piece over here and of course branches uh, higher in energy as well. So here is what we have as a consequence of zone folding. We have a number of bands. We have a number of bands which are separated by gaps, right? And these are of course our band gaps. Now it, this picture here um, is kind of what we attempted to uh, provide a glimpse of at the very end of the previous lecture. Right? So we have these bands separated by gaps and our k values corresponding to each of these energies over here um, label our wave functions. And that labeling is now going to be provided by our blocks theorem. The labeling that our blocks theorem is going to uh, provide us uh, for the wave functions is really a consequence of the periodic potential that our electrons uh, encounter. 
So, if the potential V of R that you find in the Hamiltonian is periodic, then Bloch's theorem states that the wave function psi of R can be written as a product of two quantities, the phase factor e to the i k dot r and a function u k of r which is a periodic function. Note that the wave function itself does not have to be periodic at all. Although the modulo square of the wave function has to be periodic and has to reflect the underlying symmetry of your crystal. Why is that? Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, the wave function is not a physical observable, right? It's a mathematical construct. Uh, one cannot directly measure the wave function of, of a system. On the other hand, the modulo square of the wave function is indeed a physical observable. It can be interpreted as the uh, charge density, in this particular case, electronic charge density. And since uh, any physical observable of a system has to reflect the underlying symmetry of the system, the modulo square of the wave function, the charge density, has to be periodic. Okay, so let me also make another point here. Um, note that uh, the wave function psi and the periodic function u uh, have a, a subscript k. Uh, so these, uh, these, these k labels are of course labels of our uh, solutions. They are the labels we have been seeking. And of course they are also uh, reciprocal space uh, uh, quantities. So this is something to bear in mind. So every energy solution is going to be associated with it a wave function and that wave function is going to be labeled with, uh, with, with, a, with a label k and that is going to provide a description of the shape or the nature of, of, of that particular wave function. So the labeling is based on reciprocal space. Okay, so the bottom line of the Bloch's theorem is very simply the following. If you have a Hamiltonian that contains a potential that is periodic, then uh, the wave function uh, corresponding to that system has to have a certain form. The wave, wave function does not have to be periodic at all, but it should be possible to write the wave function as a product of a periodic function and a phase factor e to the i k dot r. And the k values essentially label the various possible solutions to your Schrodinger's equation. There are of course many ways to prove this theorem and we are going to adopt a, a simple strategy. Uh, let us say we have a 1D lattice with uh, n unit cells, right? where n is of course very very large and we are going to assume um, periodic boundary conditions as we have done a few times in the past. So here is our uh, uh, lattice lattice parameter A, you've got uh, n unit cells, um, n is of course very large, um, although I'm showing uh, n to be a very small number over here, uh, you have to use your imagination. Uh, and of course we impose uh, PBC, uh, periodic boundary conditions, meaning that the leftmost unit cell is equivalent to the rightmost unit cell. There is a very elegant way of doing this using what is called as the uh, Born, uh, von Karman boundary condition which is uh, pictorially uh, depicted over here and the consequence of this periodic boundary condition is that uh, the wave function value at x equals 0 uh, should be equal to the wave function value at x equals n a. In addition of course uh, as I have uh, already mentioned the uh, modulo square of the wave function uh, has to display uh, the periodicity of the lattice itself. So here is the second condition, right? Modulo square of the wave function at any value x, at any position x, should be equal to the modulo square of the wave function at x plus n a, where n, uh, the small n, can take on any integer value, uh, 1, 2, 3, etc., all the way up to capital N. So, while the first condition, while the first equation over here enforces the periodicity uh, as prescribed by the periodic boundary condition, the, the, second, the second condition, the second equation uh, enforces uh, periodicity at the level of the unit cell. So the wave function does not have to display the periodicity at the level of the unit cell, but the modulo square of the wave function 
has to display periodicity at the level of the unit cell. That this is of course a simple consequence of the fact that uh, our modulo square of the wave function is a uh, can be looked upon as a physical observable and any physical observable has to display the underlying symmetry of the system. Now these two constraints that we have imposed can both be simultaneously true only if the wave function has a form uh, as prescribed by the Bloch's theorem which we had uh, stated earlier. Let me re rewrite that right now. So here it is. Here is the Bloch's theorem that I had uh, stated earlier and I am claiming that uh, uh, these two equations will be satisfied if our wave function has this form. This can of course be verified quite easily. Uh, first we note that uh, this uk of x quantity over here is uh, periodic at the unit cell level meaning that uk of x will be equal to uk of x plus na where n is any integer. 1, 2, 3, etc., all the way up to capital N, like it's defined over here. With that in mind, let's try to uh, prove uh, that uh, our wave function satisfies that constraint. So, if you take the modulo square of our wave function, that will be equal to the modulo square of e to the i k x times the modulo square of our periodic function u. Uh, the modulo square of uh, e to the i k x is just 1, and so the modulo square of our wave function is equal to the modulo square of uh, our periodic function u k of x. And so, uh, this, this equation here is, uh, is satisfied. As uh, u displays uh, the requisite uh, periodicity. Now, let us uh, uh, try to ascertain that uh, this wave function form satisfies this constraint. In fact, this step will allow us to identify the possible values uh, our k can take. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, our, our uh, uh, form for the wave function and we will uh, attempt to see what happens when we evaluate the wave function at x equals 0 and x equals n a. When x equals 0, this first term becomes 1 and uh, this quantity here is, uh, you know, u, u k of 0. When x equals n a, um, the second piece here, over here uh, is u k of uh, n a, which is actually equal to u k of 0, simply because uh, of uh, periodicity. What about e to the i k x? When x equals n a, that becomes e to the i k times n a. And we want that to be equal 1 for this constraint to be satisfied. So e to the i k n a can be 1 only when k takes on these specific values. Right? Note that L here in the denominator is nothing but n a. So when k equals 2 pi over L times an integer, e to the i k n a will be 1. And so we know what possible values k can take. In fact, there are uh, going to be as many k values uh, as there are unit cells. In other words, uh, the total number of possible values k can take is equal to capital N. Note, of course, that uh, N is a very large number in principle. And uh, so the bottom line of all of this is that if our uh, Hamiltonian contains a, a periodic potential, then our wave function um, has to have a certain form as prescribed by the Bloch's theorem and um, there can be n different types of uh, wave functions that one can write down where n is of course a very large number uh, equal to the number of unit cells and the different types of wave functions can be labeled using the uh, index k. At this point let me make uh, one interesting observation, you may wonder what happens if you set the periodic potential to zero. Um, and in fact, when you set the periodic potential to zero everywhere, you should get the free electron solution, um, which is uh, e to the i k r or e to the i k x in this 1D example. And uh, that you would get when our periodic uh, part of the wave function u k of x uh, goes to one. 
Okay, so now let us uh, attempt to get a better understanding of uh, what this blocks theorem really means and what do we really mean by saying that the wave function has to have a particular form etc. by visualizing uh, a few types uh, of, uh, of our uh, uh, block functions. Let us of course remember the uh, form uh, of the wave function as prescribed by the block function. So the wave function is going to be a product of a, a phase factor, a plane wave e to the i k x and a periodic function u k of x. What we are going to do is we are going to assume a 1D lattice. We are going to assume a form for the periodic function u k of x and we will just visualize the wave function for a few special values of k. Okay, so here are a few uh, wave function types uh, labeled by the value of k. Let us take the simplest of all these examples. Um, the k equals 0 case, which is what is shown over here. So k equals 0 basically implies that the wavelength of our wave is uh, uh, infinity. So when k equals 0, the, uh, uh, the phase factor, the plane wave part uh, becomes 1. And so our wave function, when k equals 0, is simply equal to the uh, periodic part of the wave function. And, uh, and so our wave function has uh, the periodicity at the unit cell level that uh, our u should have. And that is what we are representing over here. Uh, in this manner, the, the dots represent the atoms in our uh, 1D lattice. And, and this is how the wave function looks for uh, the k equals 0 case. Let us now move on to the next uh, example uh, in which uh, case k equals 2 pi over 10 a. Note that uh, this value of k as well as the other values that we have chosen uh, are all allowed values of k as per uh, our prescription in the previous slide. In any case, when k equals 2 pi over uh, 10a, the wavelength is basically 10a, right? or the half wavelength is uh, 5a, So, which is what I've indicated over here. So once again, we have our 1D lattice. And for this uh, example uh, of k equals uh, 2 pi over 10a, uh, our wave function is going to be a periodic function modulated by a wave with a wavelength of 10a or half wavelength of 5a. This is exactly what you, you see over here. Right? So our wave function is uh, simultaneously displaying the features of the periodic function in terms of these undulations, uh, but it is also displaying the features of the uh, uh, phase factor or the plane wave, uh, which is uh, what you can see as, as an envelope function. Right? So that's the wave the wavelength of 5a, or I'm sorry, wavelength of 10a. Moving on to the third example, uh, k equals 2 pi over 6a implies that the wavelength is uh, 6a or the half wavelength is 3a. And uh, we go through the same uh, exercise, same thought processes, and we uh, uh, get a picturization of the wave function for this example as this function. Once again, um, the features of the periodic uh, quantity u can be seen as the uh, undulations and the features of the plane wave, the phase factor over here with a k value equals 2 pi over 6a can be seen as this envelope function. So that's the wave with a wavelength of 6a or half wavelength of 3a. And finally, uh, in this in this uh, case of uh, k equals 2 pi over 2a or pi over a, uh, the wavelength is equal to 2a, mm, we, we, we get this, uh, this result. Note that k equals pi over a is a Brevon zone boundary. You encounter um, uh, Bragg scattering and uh, uh, this type of uh, situation may be familiar to you uh, based on the discussion we had when we talked about uh, uh, phonons and the phonon band structure and what happens to our lattice waves close to the Brevon zone boundaries. The Bloch's theorem thus provides us with a way of uh, labeling our wave functions. 
Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, these pictures uh, carefully, you will see that there is there is a there is a nodal uh, pattern. There is a nodal structure. Um, the second example uh, that we are seeing over here, uh, in fact, displays a a node right there. Right, it displays a node right there, node right there, and so forth. Uh, likewise, uh, in this in this example. Uh, we have also a nodal uh, uh, situation. So there is a node here and there is a node there uh, and uh, a node there and so forth. So there is a nodal structure which uh, which are labeled by our K. This is very very similar to what we encountered at the end of uh, the last lecture on uh, molecular orbital theory. Uh, there again we started from um, you know um, dimers and went on to trimers, tetramers and then we ended up with a system with a large number of atoms and we argued that uh, there is a pattern in the way uh, nodes occur uh, in various systems and um, if you have a system with n atoms where n is a very large number you will have n different wave functions and uh, each one will have a different type of uh, different number of uh, nodes and the wave vector k is essentially labeling uh, uh, the the nodes, um, labeling the wave functions based on the number of nodes the wave function displays. What we saw there was the chemist's uh, um, route to the band structure, and what we are seeing here right now is the physicist's route to uh, uh, labeling wave functions. They are essentially the same thing. Two different routes to the same goal. The Bloch's theorem is a very powerful result which we will use uh, quite a bit in the next few, next couple of lectures. Bear in mind that we have not really uh, rigorously proved uh, uh, Bloch's theorem in today's lecture. Uh, I just gave a heuristic proof. I uh, basically made a demonstration uh, of uh, uh, why the Bloch's theorem should, be, uh, should work um, and should be correct. Uh, based on uh, certain constraints on the wave functions. If one desires a rigorous uh, proof uh, or derivation of the Bloch's theorem, uh, one needs to dive into this branch of uh, mathematics uh, called group theory. And we encountered group theory at uh, in the very first lecture of this series when we talked about uh, space groups and point groups. So group theory is really a study of uh, uh, the symmetry of uh, systems and, and the consequences of the symmetry and uh, the, the Bloch's theorem is really a consequence of uh, what we call as the translational symmetry. We now enter the last segment of uh, uh, today's uh, lecture uh, and we are going to very briefly talk about uh, uh, Brevon zones and uh, symmetry in k-space. Let us uh, go from one-dimensional situations to two-dimensional ones uh, just to illustrate the beauty of uh, reciprocal space. Uh, we are going to consider a, a square lattice in real space with a periodicity of A. And uh, this implies a square lattice in reciprocal space as well with a periodicity of uh, 2 pi over A. This is all too familiar. Uh, now let us uh, just draw our... Uh, square lattice in reciprocal space. Okay, so there we have it, our square lattice in reciprocal space and it's a, it has a lattice constant of 2 pi over A. Now let us recall how uh, we construct uh, the Brevon zone. Uh, first we pick any uh, reference point, uh, any reference lattice point, let's say we pick that one and uh, we find the nearest neighbor lattice points of that uh, reference lattice point and we draw perpendicular uh, uh, plane bisectors uh, of the vector from our reference lattice point to each of the nearest neighbor lattice points and that will give us a give us an object which is what we call as the as the first Brevon zone the blue uh, vectors are the vectors that connect our reference lattice point to the four nearest neighbor lattice points and uh, if we form the perpendicular bisector of each of those uh, four vectors, we get this square uh, in which you see in red. And that is uh, really our uh, what we call as our uh, first Brevon zone. 
Now you may wonder why do we call this the uh, first Brouhan zone? Uh, the reason is that um, we can continue with the same procedure. We can draw these vectors uh, that connect our reference lattice point to its uh, second nearest neighbors um, and form uh, perpendicular bisectors of uh, those new vectors and we, we will get another shape uh, and the difference uh, uh, between that shape and the first Brouhan zone um, would give us a region which we actually call as the second Brouhan zone. So let's go about making that construction. So here is a vector that connects our reference point to uh, a second nearest neighbor uh, lattice point and of course we have uh, uh, more of those uh, second nearest neighbor points. Those are three other ones. Just to avoid clutter I did not draw uh, all of those vectors and I just drew just one of them over here and its perpendicular bisector is just that and likewise the perpendicular bisectors of the other three vectors would form uh, that uh, square. Now the region between the red square and the black square is what we call as the second Brouhan zone. So there it is, the hatched region, uh, this piece, this piece, this piece and that piece combined together uh, um, is called the second Brouhan zone. And note that the area of the first Brouhan zone is equal to the area of the second Brouhan zone. So in any case, it is for this reason that the first Brouhan zone is uh, called the first Brouhan zone. It's got the label first uh, because you can uh, do this ad infinitum and define um, a number of uh, um, a series of uh, Brouhan zones. Now, why do we care about uh, Brouhan zones at all? Uh, it is simply because uh, the k values, the uh, k vectors within the first Brouhan zone um, are all that matter really um, because any other uh, k value that is outside of the Brevon zone can actually be translated back into the Brevon zone uh, using one of the many uh, reciprocal lattice vectors and this is something we had again encountered in the past when we discussed uh, lattice wa waves, phonons and phonon band structures. Uh, we noted at that point that uh, waves with uh, uh, wave vectors um, lying outside of the first Brevon zone can actually be translated back into the uh, first Brevon zone and this is what gave us the rationale for doing this thing called zone folding and that is something we, uh, we, we touched upon at the very beginning of today's lecture as well. Okay, so the main point is that uh, uh, any property which is a function of k need be considered only within the first Brevon zone. So here is a mathematical way of capturing uh, the essence of what I just said. Uh, e is our uh, energy and uh, E versus K is of course our band structure. E is a function of K. And uh, G, the capital G, uh, is essentially any reciprocal uh, lattice vector. Uh, and as a reminder, I am just uh, defining uh, G. Uh, recall that G is uh, some integer multiple of the lattice vector B1. Uh, plus another integer m multiplied by our uh, uh, lattice vector b2 where b1 is of course uh, 2 pi over a times the unit vector along the x direction and b2 is a unit vector uh, y times uh, 2 pi over a. So g is a reciprocal, any, any uh, reciprocal lattice vector that connects any uh, point to any other point, right? So the mathematical statement that I have written down uh, basically states that uh, the the, the value of energy uh, uh, at any uh, k plus g is the same as the value of energy at k. And k is of course any point within the first Brevon zone. Note the interesting fact that uh, because k is any point within the first Brevon zone and g is any uh, reciprocal lattice vector, k plus g basically spans the entire reciprocal space not just within the first Brevon zone but the entire space. In any case, E k plus g equals E k uh, basically means that we can restrict attention to just the first Brevon zone. So this is one interesting symmetry property that has allowed us to do this thing called the zone folding. 
Let me note that there is another interesting symmetry property and this has to do with inversion. Uh, so, so this property basically says that E at any value of K is going to be equal to E at the corresponding negative value of K. So here is the mathematical statement that captures what I just said. And because of this inversion symmetry, we actually have to worry only about uh, half of the Brevon zone because the properties corresponding to the other half of the Brevon zone uh, can, can be obtained from the first half. Let me note a third interesting symmetry property. Uh, EK also has the same rotational symmetry as the real lattice. Uh, which means that our work is going to reduce even more. The consequence of this last property is that we don't even have to consider the entire first Brevon zone. We can consider uh, just a little wedge which is uh, one eighth the size of the first Brevon zone. So this irreducible wedge of the Brevon zone is shown, shown over here. So this is really all we need to consider. So, okay, bear in mind that this is the first Brevon zone. Um, and the inversion symmetry drops uh, the region that we need to consider uh, by one half. And the additional rotational symmetry considerations bring down the portion that needs to be considered as just this. This little wedge here is one eighth the size of the entire zone. All other points, all other points within our first Brevon zone can be obtained from uh, points within this wedge uh, by uh, rotation or inversion. And all other points outside the Brevon zone can be obtained by translation, thanks to this. So, the point is that in a square lattice, in a two-dimensional uh, square lattice situation, the irreducible wedge of the Brevon zone, which is also called as IBZ, is uh, uh, one eighth the size of the first Brevon zone. And in the case of a three dimensional situation, let's say a cubic uh, lattice, only one over 48 of the first Brevon zone needs to be considered. And, uh, and so the irreducible Brevon zone in the case of a three dimensional cubic system. Um, is going to be 148 the size of the first Brevon zone. The reason uh, this wedge is called the irreducible wedge is simply because you cannot uh, make it any smaller. It's irreducible. All of these symmetry properties, especially the feature of zone folding, uh, becomes very useful and we will use it uh, over and over again in the next uh, few lectures in order to understand uh, band structures better. Thank you.